Welcome and welcome back, everybody, to the OK Grognard Show. It is Monday, December 20th, 2021, 10 a.m. Central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And uh, we're going to wrap up the year and this series on artifacts and relics. This is part seven, as uh, looked over from the... uh, First edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeon Master's Guide section on it. Artifacts and Relics. It is uh, a pretty meaty section. We've gone through it for six episodes, and this will be the final one. I'm not sure we'll actually get to every artifact and relic, because... uh, there's quite a bit left. I guess we could go a little long if we needed to. Or we could just cherry pick some of the artifacts and relics and enjoy what we're looking at. I think. I don't know. What do you think? Think so? Okay. Let's start. Let's jump right in and see where we're at. Mace of Cuthbert. <clears throat> of course, uh, in Gary's. Greyhawk, St. Cuthbert was one of the uh, deities, and this would then be a mace dedicated to him. Cherry pick the best. Good morning, how you doing, Sarah? Welcome, George. Um, yeah, it could. Let, let's see how it goes. This weapon is said to be that actually used by the venerable Saint Cuthbert of the Cudgel when he demonstrated the folly of error to the unbeliever. Over the decades since then, holy relics of the saint himself have been encased within the mace to give this arm of lawful good a plus five bonus for both hitting and damage as well as disruption effects. Only clerics with 18 strength of lawful good alignment are able to wield this weapon and gain these other powers. And it has a few. Not uh, not one of the busiest of artifacts, but man, plus five, plus five, that's pretty good right out of the gate. And uh, the limitations placed upon it, you have to be 18 strength and you have to be lawful good these are and clerics you have to be a cleric these are important uh, distinctions for artifacts and relics or restrictions that they uh, have limited availability or limited use I think that's good hey Rick welcome and it's uh, if you devise any of your own, definitely put some limitations on them. Who can use them and under what conditions? I definitely advise that. And I'd say uh, even if you use some of the ones that are in here, it would not uh, would not be a bad thing to add some additional restrictions to adjust them a little bit. Let's face it. The books have been out a long time, and a lot of people that are playing the game with you and elsewhere may well have read through a lot of this. So when this was new and exciting and not a lot of people have seen it, then uh, a little easier to introduce one of these and make it seem fresh. So do the same. Do the same. Make Make it fresh. Make it your own. The Machine of Lum the Mad. Perhaps this strange device was built by gods long forgotten and survived the eons since their passing. For it is incredibly ancient and of workmanship unlike anything known today. The machine was used by Baron Lum to build an empire. But what has since become of this ponderous mechanism, none can say. Legends report that it has 60 levers, 40 dials, and 20 switches, but only about one-half still function. 
parenthetically says. Singly or in combination, these controls will generate all sorts of powers and effects. The machine is delicate, intricate, bulky, and very heavy, 5,500 pounds. It cannot be moved normally, and any serious jolt will set off and then destroy one to four functions of the artifact, which can never be restored. It has a booth of a size suitable for four man-sized creatures, four feet by five feet by seven feet, to stand inside, and if a creature or object is placed therein and the machine's controls are worked, something might happen. Might. You must matrix the 60 levers, 40 dials, and 20 switches showing which will perform functions. You may opt to include powers and or effects of your own devising. That's an always thing. Big old table here, but of course it's going to be fairly random until you try a few things and figure out what might work. Not all of it is going to be good for you. Mighty Servant of Luko. Those who are most knowledgeable regarding ancient artifacts believe that this device is of the same manufacture as the Machine of Lum, the Mighty Servant of the famous General Luko is a towering automaton of crystal, unknown metals, and strained fibrous material. It is over nine feet tall, six feet deep, and four and a half feet wide. Inside is a compartment suitable for holding two man-sized creatures, and there is space for four to five others to sit outside. If the possessor knows the proper command phrases, he or she can use the Mighty Servant as a transportation mode, magical attack device, or fighting machine. It is armor class, negative one, and can withstand 60 hit points of damage. Note, all weapons do only 50% of their normal damage round down. The Mighty Servant regenerates, self-repairs two points of damage per round. Its magical resistance is a hundred percent. Acid, cold, fire, heat, vacuum, and or water have no effect on the device. Electrical slash lightning attacks cause only 20 percent normal damage. Round down. Even if the servant f falls the magic, uh, even if the servant fails the magical resistance check. The Mighty Servant moves at a maximum speed of 30 feet. After each 12 hours of operation, it must rest, recharge itself for one hour. Any intelligent viewer boop, 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 within 12 inches, 120 feet, must save versus magic, plus two on the die roll, or flee in panic. It can attack but one time per round and it has a base 15% chance to hit an opponent regardless of its armor class. Opponents with intelligence and a dexterity of 15 or better reduce the base chance to hit by 2.5% per 1 point of dexterity above 14. A hit from the Mighty Servant causes 10 to 100 hit points of damage. In addition, the Mighty Servant of Luko has these powers and effects. And it outlines six from the first table, six from the second, one from the third, two from the fourth, and two from the sixth. So there's some nasty stuff going on there. Effects are triggered by major power use. The Mighty Servant will obey those humans who learn its secrets of atomic of automation and control. So that's a beauty. Well, you know, yeah, we go at this pace. We won't get through all of them. So let's just kind of give an overview of some of them to finish up the uh, the section and uh, urge people to check them out on their own. Orb of Dragonkind. So they're actually 
a number of these orbs in the older because it starts with hatchling and then wormkin dragonette dragon great serpent they become more and more powerful or rather the greater the orb the greater the power and they all have uh, a sort of uh, intelligence and ego just like certain swords will will have that as well they are definitely their own thing eight globes of carven white jade So while you might control one, there is a chance that it's going to work some effects on you, too. And if you can communicate with it, I suppose, since it has an intelligence, an ego, you might find some uh, like-mindedness, maybe a purpose that both of you can share and work towards. Well, got the six, Fire Drake, Elder Worm, and of course, Eternal Grand Master Dragon. <clears throat> it would be suggested that the greater the device, this last one, having an 18 intelligence and ego, the tougher these things are to control Note regarding orbs of dragonkind. All of these orbs have a strong component of evil and a neutral or good character. We'll have to save versus magic to resist charming a neutral good dragon. Charm range is 50 feet, requires a full round. Subject needs to be fully awake and aware of the character. So, you're not going to charm a sleeping dragon with these. Because of the original purpose, only evil dragons are automatically charmed. Neutral save at minus four on their dice. Good at minus two. Charmed characters can be considered as possessing 50% normal wisdom with respect to the orb of dragon kind. Any possessor with feeble mind affecting him or her, or insane will have three intelligence or 50% of normal, respectively. The orb can control only an active and awake mind. Destruction of a character will typically be by sacrifice to a dragon, if one is at hand, otherwise by the most sure and expeditious method. Orb of Might. Orbs are very popular, weren't they? So there's three orbs of might. Evil, good, neutrality. If you aren't of the, the uh, proper alignment, you have to make a saving throw to avoid death. And even if you avoid death, you'll take 4 to 24 hit points of damage. If the character so touching an orb also possesses a crown or scepter, surviving the saving throw versus magic will invoke a malevolent effect from table four. So it's nasty, but it's really uh, pricey, right? Platinum encrusted with gems worth 100,000 gold pieces or more. Each, each is equal to a gem of brightness. It also has some small effects so not the most powerful of items but pretty nifty queen Alyssa's marvelous nightingale bit of a history there as to who made it steeped in gary uh gary's greyhawk lore can the queen would bend uh, bend all to her will with enchantments from the device, 
throughout her reign of several centuries. Must be nice, living for centuries. Nightingale never escaped its confinement. This bejeweled songbird seems to actually spring to life when its mechanism is activated. So I don't know who uh, recalls Beepo? Is that the name of the owl from uh, Clash of the Titans? The 80s uh, fantasy Harryhausen film? Certainly uh, a similar type of thing here. Of course, this uh, predates that movie. So don't say Gary stole the mechanical bird idea from that movie. Sends out, shoot forth, uh, scintillating rays of brilliant color, each having a different effect. Its songs likewise work magical wonders. And it's got a uh, fair number of potential... Also has some potential psionic ability. I'm not a big fan of psionics myself. I think the magic system is enough to to make it fantastical as a game. For my money, Psionics is uh, not a bad system. It just takes me away from the medieval fantasy aspects. I think um, it works well in science fiction games and that sort of thing, or even in real-world, otherworldly, Cthulhu-esque type of... Uh, type of games. Ring of Gax. Who's that named after? <laughs> this piece of jewelry is of totally alien origin. For while its loop appears to be of platinum and its stone a very fine spinel, examination by the most astute dwarf or expert jeweler will discover the workmanship to be unique in the gem of unknown type. Must be placed on the finger to discover its power. The wearer can turn nine, the nine-faceted gem in the ring, and each facing of the gem gives a different power. So that's a neat way to do it. And you get a whole bunch of them here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can pick them out or... just roll them randomly. Some of these things, as we as we spoke last time, some of these things are more fun when they're completely random. Sometimes they are more fun when they're the thematic and tied to your setting or tied to an area of your setting more closely. Obviously, things like the uh, orbs of dragon kind are something that are uh, tied a little more closely. Ring of Gax, though, I mean, except for the name, it's a ring with nine powers, right? And it's kind of nifty that you turn the gem to make the different powers function. Pretty simple in that way. Now, if you have some way of marking the different facets so that you can tell one from another, then uh, you can control it. Pretty straightforward. Rod of Seven Parts. <clears throat> this classic, the Wind Dukes of Agua. I'm sure that's wrong. Aka, maybe is the Q uh, is the Q a K sound in this case? Are the legendary creators of this artifact? It is said that they constructed the rod to use in a great battle of Pesh, where chaos and law contended. There the rod was shattered and its parts scattered, but the enchantments of the item were such that nothing could actually destroy it. So if its sections are recovered and put together in the correct order, it says in italics, so there's that, the possessor will wield a weapon of surpassing power. The seven parts of the rod are slightly different. The first being the largest in length and diameter, the seventh being the smallest, 
No single part has any power or effect alone. Singly, each appears to be a short bar or baton, except the seventh, which looks much the same as a short metal wand. The first part of the rod will give the possessor a feeling as to which direction the second part lies in, but only when the character thinks of the section as a fraction of a whole magic item. If the second, third, etc. parts are discovered prior to the first, second, etc., the section will lead only to the next higher number, not a lower one. If an out of order section is placed against another part of the rod, first, third, second, sixth, whatever, the higher numbered piece will teleport away in a random direction from 100 to 1,000 miles away. When fully assembled, the rod of seven parts is almost five feet long. As soon as the three, as soon as three joining sections are fitted together, the possessor is unable to let go of the rod as long as he or she lives until all parts are joined. The powers of each part of the rod are cumulative whenever joined, but the full power is shown only work when all parts of the artifact are joined. Although the rod cannot be disassembled by its possessor, each time a prime power is used, there is a 1 in 20, 5% chance that the hole will fly into its component pieces and teleport 100 to 1200 miles away in random directions. So there's a whole adventure quest that uh, followed this classic rod of seven parts. Obviously, once you get the third, you're committed to the quest. It has some mighty powers based on the various parts and the whole. If it's not assembled in order, the power effects are not cumulative. Only the power or effect of the last piece joined will activate, all prior parts being negated. Note that, as stated earlier, if the first section is joined to the second and the second to the third, power effects are cumulative, and when the entire rod is assembled, the additional full powers and effect are gained. Scepter of Might. Three scepters of might. Evil, good, neutrality. And uh, we talked about the orb earlier and the crown. So similarly, each one is tied to an alignment. And if you have all three, woohoo, it makes you quite powerful indeed. Sort of Cass. A little nod to Tim Cask, I'm sure. There is recorded this additional information regarding the Lich Vecna. When Vecna grew in power, he appointed the most evil and ruthless lieutenant to serve as his bodyguard and right hand. The henchman was the Lord Cass, and for him Vecna found a weapon of potency, a long and thin flashet of dull gray metal, a sword of unsurpassed hardness, with a sharp point, keen edges, and magical properties. For a long, long time, Cass faithfully served the Lich, but his, as, his, as his power grew, so did his hubris, for the sword was constantly urging him on, saying that Cass was now greater than Vecna himself. And with the might of the sword to aid and direct him, Cass could rule in Vecna's stead, Legend says that the destruction of Vecna was by Cass and his sword, but at the same time Vecna wrought his rebellious lieutenant's doom, and the world was made brighter thereby. <laughs> nice when he throws a little lore in there. Powers of sword are hinted at. Yeah, it's a plus six defender. Double damage against all creatures, which are from a plane other than the prime material plane. Ooh, is it back up over here? How are we doing on time? 24? Yeah, we're pretty far along. Highly evil and chaotic in alignment with a 15 intelligence and a 19 ego. So it definitely wants to control things. 
or at least make you think you're in control while it's coercing you into various things and it's got a fair number of powers too so it's quite the sword the teeth of Dalvernar. I always try to read these names backwards when they seem to be almost gibberish because quite often names of things were names of other things that were written backwards or scrambled. This is probably an anagram of something, although I do not know what. Perhaps you can check it out later. The gods themselves gave the gave uh, powers, special powers to the teeth. Mm -mm. Each of the teeth has some power, and if one character manages to gain a full quarter, half, or all of them, other grand benefits accrue. So again, another one of these things, which is a number of parts, and which, uh, if collected and brought together, makes the whole more powerful. It's a good premise for a lot of things. <clears throat> You'll probably find that there are some things that uh, work really well like that. Things that are part of a set or things that are portions of a larger object. Throne of the Gods. It is said that somewhere in a cavern is the heart of a majestic. In the heart or from the heart of a majestic mountain is a massive stone chair. And that's pretty cool because uh, objects like this generally aren't meant to be moved, so you have to go to them. Uh, this would work great if you're creating some artifacts or relics with things like a oracle. Hey, <laughs> XL809. Welcome. Thanks for popping in. Teeth Currency. Bad moons to have the teeth. Okay. Uh, certain, according to fables, that the character will gain a magic item, but in doing so, he or she will also be subject to a malevolent effect. So this is one of those, every good thing has a bad effect happening to it, too. So, <clears throat> unlike the, the uh, dwarf weapon early on, which, uh, as part of its regular uh, makeup, uh, changes the bearer. This is one that, using an effect, triggers a bad effect. So, just possessing it doesn't necessarily do anything nasty to you. But, being immobile and immovable makes some difference, because unless you go there and sit in the chair... The throne is not going to get all nasty on you. As a DM, you should determine which power and effects will be activated. Look for combos that make sense, right? If you do one thing, this other power is going to hit you hard. Wand of Orcus is the last one. The ghastly weapon is the property of the demon prince Orcus, but at times it is said that he will allow his wand to pass into the prime material plane in order to wreak havoc and chaos wreak chaos and evil upon all living things therein. Check out the Monster Manual for stats on the Demon Orcus and more information about him. The wielder of the wand does not have the full death-dealing power of the device. The victim, a, the victim of its blow having a saving throw versus magic to avoid death and annihilation. Gods, godlings, demon lords, greater devils, saints, and demigods are not affected at all, of course. However, the Wand of Orcus confers these other powers and effects upon the user. So it's got a fair number of uh, powers. Four from the first, two from the second, two from the third, one from the fourth, and one from the sixth. And as always with artifacts and relics, understand that uh, often the downside is worse than the benefits it might bestow. They are things of great power. You might get a major benign effect from table two, but what you're getting from table four can be so malevolent as to make it not worth using. 
So, right on. Geographically sticky artifacts are interesting, says XL. I don't know. Indeed, yeah. The, um, uh, the throne is definitely a great example. Um, you look back to Greek history or legend, oracles are basically diviners that are in one location, so you can find them. And same can be done with things like this throne or a mirror pool. I think of uh, Galadriel's pool where she can see what potential futures are and that sort of thing. So you can have stuff like that and create effects that make sense given where they are and who is uh, who is guarding them or who is uh, attached to them, who's in charge of them. In any event, we've run, a run out of time, but that was the last one anyway, so that's good. And I will say this has been a real treat doing this another year, doing it less than last year, but still enjoying it on a weekly basis. Um, we're going to be taking our winter hiatus after today. <clears throat> we'll uh, be off until Monday, January 17th. <clears throat> we'll see about changing some things or adjusting some things or maybe even uh, upgrading some things. I don't know. I don't want to say the show is on autopilot, but I pretty much like the way everything looks and feels and works and the amount of time I put into it and what I get out of it. So I might not change all that much, but we will see. And I do want to say thanks to everybody for checking it out. Thanks for popping in and joining in the chat stream when you're uh, here and able to do so. So all we'll have to do is wrap it up for the year. We've enjoyed this uh, look at the first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide section on artifacts and relics. This was part 7 and the final part. And uh, if you are going to join us in the new year on Mondays starting January 17th, then please do Join us here on Twitch for the stream. Follow the channel. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, chime in on the chat if you're able to. And if you're going to catch up with us on YouTube afterwards, then uh, by all means, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel, click the little bell so you get notifications when new episodes are uploaded. Feel free to leave comments if you have uh, questions or want to join in the conversation. It's always nice to do. This has been another year of the OK Grognard Show from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Thank you all very, very much and uh, bye-bye.